Okay, I think we're starting. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Jeff Scott. I'm really glad to welcome you this morning to our special session on oceans and human health here at the Carolina Climate uh, Conference. We're really delighted to have you joining us here today. Today, we're going to have a, a panel discussion um, in which we'll have several presentations followed by a full discussion at the end of our session. Um, we're really delighted to have three outstanding panelists here today. Well, let's say at least two. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Jeff Scott. I'm a uh, professor and chair of the Department of Environmental Health Sciences in the Arnold School of Public Health. And um, joining our panel today is Dr. Paul Sandifer, director of the Center for Coastal Environmental and Human Health, and also part of our uh, NIEHS Center for Oceans and Human Health. And um, Dr. Sandifer also uh, was uh, chief scientist for the National Ocean Service at NOAA, uh, science advisor to the NOAA administrator, and also the former director of the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. So Paul has extensive experience in dealing with coastal issues. Also joining us on the panel today, is Katia Altman, and Katia is a PhD student in the Arnold School of Public Health uh, in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences, and she'll be uh, joining us today to talk about uh, communication of risk uh, to the public. Dr. Sandifer will be talking about research needs, and I'm going to jump in and start us off by talking a little bit about what is Oceans in Human Health. Just a couple of things. We'll ask you to please put your questions in the chat uh, if you can. What we will try to do is go through these three presentations, each about 20 minutes. And if we have time at the end, we'll take a few questions. If we don't get them all, we'll save them to the very end that we don't get to. And we'll have about 20 to 25 minutes for discussion at the end. So we really want to ask you to just sit back and we'll get started. And I'll start us off with our first talk, um, and I'm going to go ahead and go to full screen on this. I think I can. There we go. So I'm going to talk today about oceans and human health, a one health concept whose time has come. And I want to again thank Dr. Uh, Sandifer and Katia for their help and a cast of a bunch of folks at our different uh, institutions that are part of our OHH Center at, at USC. So One Health, what is that? One Health is a CDC concept that recognizes the health of people is connected to animals and the environment. It is collaborative, multi-sectorial, and transdisciplinary, working at all the way from the local, regional, national, and global level to really recognize the interconnection between people, animals, and plants and their shared environment. This is really important, as we've seen this year, because six out of every 10 infectious diseases in humans are spread from animals. And we've certainly had a year where we've really paid attention to infectious diseases with COVID. Now, if we take a look at oceans in human health, traditionally, we have assessed man's impact on the oceans. But it came to our attention that when we have uh, unhealthy ocean conditions, this in turn can affect human health. Thus, that full circle is connected between oceans and human health. So oceans and human health is a one health approach. So uh, our Center for Oceans and Human Health and Climate Change Interaction, Dr. Sandifer and I are the directors, and our mission is to really evaluate the effects of climate change and other environmental factors on microbial and harmful algal bloom related illnesses and disease with the attempt to develop better predictive forecasts and health prevention strategies that inform the public, reduce exposure, thus protecting public health. Our specific focus is on Vibrio bacteria and increasing toxin production from freshwater harmful algal blooms. We also have a very direct focus on human health, looking at the effects of HAB toxins and infectious microbes on major organ systems such as the liver, kidney, gut microbiome, brain axis, and ovary, and their relationship to inflammatory disease. We also have a community engagement focus 
uh, focusing on research translation to coastal freshwater and environmental justice communities. And you'll be hearing more from uh, Katia about our strategy. So I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, about this. Our center has six partners, the Citadel, Baylor, the University of South Carolina, College of Charleston, University of Maryland, and Rutgers University. So if we take a look at the impact of pathogen and HABs on human health, Ralston estimates that we spend almost a billion dollars a year on healthcare costs related to illness um, from marine-borne pathogens. This includes $350 million due to foodborne illnesses related to seafood consumption and over $300 million due to contact recreation on beaches. And Vibrios, for example, is, are one of the major uh, microbes, for example, that causes illness. So if we take a look, climate change may directly affect the growth, survival, persistence, distribution, transmission, and virulence <clears throat> of disease-causing organisms like microbes and harmful algal blooms. So today we're gonna to take a look at how things such as temperature and salinity changes associated with climate change uh, and other environmental factors can affect uh, these, these organisms. So let's begin with the Vibrios. Most of you are probably familiar with Vibrio cholera, but it's his first and second cousins, Vibrio parahemolyticus and Vibrio vulnificus that causes great concerns because they are responsible for most illnesses related to seafood consumption. Vibrio vulnificus is responsible for 95% of the fatalities associated with seafood production. It can also produce wound infections, can be fatal 20 to 30% of the time in healthy individuals. Most illnesses in seafood though are caused by Vibrio parahemolyticus. Um, and Rita Caldwell has estimated that Vibrio infection rates have increased globally by 41% over the last decade and with a 31% increase in the rate of antibody resistance. If we take and compare U.S. numbers, in 2004, the Centers for Disease Control estimated 8,000 cases per year. In 2019, they had increased tenfold to 80,000 cases per year. So what really has caused this rapid emergence of this increase in illnesses? Well, if we take a look, here's a slide that gives us a clue. Um, this is an outbreak of Vibrio parahemolyticus for the first time in Alaska in 2004. And for the first recorded time in history, the National Weather Service recorded sea temp seawater temperatures above the critical growth temperature of 15 degrees C during the month of June and July. You immediately see thereafter, <clears throat> we begin to get spikes in those blue bars, which are cases of Vibrio parahemolyticus illness from the consumption of molluscan shellfish in Alaska. So that represented a significant geographical range extension of Vibrios uh, into Alaska. In addition to increasing the geographical area, we also have evidence that temperature may be playing a role in terms of the increased duration of exposure or time. Here we have data that are um, decadal comparisons of the number of days above the critical growth temperature for Vibrio bulnificus of 20 degrees C with two decades, 1989 to 1997 and 1998 to 2007. The gray bars ind indicate the number of increased cases of illness um, uh, for those comparisons in the months of April and November. Normally, Vibrio bulnificus mainly causes illness in June to the end of September but we have been seeing increasing evidence of that range of duration of exposure being extended to as early as April and November. So you can clearly see a three to four fold increase in the number of cases of Vibrio illness per metric ton of oyster harvested as we compare the most recent decadal comparison in 2007, both in the months of April and November with the uh, ones ending in 1997. Clear evidence that both time and space are increasing. And if you increase time and space in terms of Vibrio illness, that will lead to increased numbers of cases. And temperature certainly plays a role. Uh, another significant factor 
is the fact that these Vibrios are highly antibiotic resistant. Some 350 isolates along the South Carolina, Georgia coast, only 1% or less have no antibiotic resistance. If you get a Vibrio infection, it is going to be have multiple antibiotic resistance to as many as 13 different mainline antibiotics, on average about eight antibiotics. Now, if we turn our attentions to harmful algal blooms, uh, and this is a distribution of all the marine halves, the cyanobacteria, which can be freshwater, um, or mainly freshwater, are the inverted blue triangles. You see those in the Great Lakes and along certain parts of the east coast of the U.S., the Gulf, and Florida. And you can see that these, these harmful algae, both marine and freshwater, cause fish kills. They're responsible for a large number of uh, marine mammal strandings. They close beaches. A 19-month closure in Florida on the east and west coast with both marine and freshwater blooms, causing great economic damage in 2018, 2019. And then we see the closure in Toledo in the Great Lakes in 2014 with cyanobacteria blooms there. Again, if we look at the HABs, though, we see the same picture emerge. This is a species, Alexandrium cantonella. Normally, it grows for only 109 days in Puget Sound, closing shellfish harvesting often in, in that area. But you'll notice with a two degree centigrade increase, instead of just being a nuisance problem in the summer, this now extends the growth cycle all the way out almost to half the year. And that means we, and if you can see with increasing temperatures over the next decade, uh, or, or excuse me, century, we, we may see even longer closures, which make a significant problem for shellfish harvestability in that region. Similarly, in addition to time, we also see an increase in spatial coverage of HABs. Uh, this is comparing the spatial coverage of paralytic shellfish poisoning in 1970 versus 2015. And yes, we have better reporting today, but most scientists acknowledge that this more recent expansion is a function of more high eutrophication levels and the combination with climate change. So what can we do as we see these types of illnesses increasing? Well, we have to alert people and prevent exposure. That is what we can do to protect health. And so one of the things we are working on are models that allow us to alert the public to tell them when there may be uh, high levels of Vibrio or high levels of harmful algal blooms to prevent exposure. Um, this is a um, neural network model developed by the late Paul Conrads, and Paul was able to actually take five of the global climate change models and predict either increases or decreases in precipitation based on the climate models, um, which would then predict flow down the, the watershed into Winya Bay in South Carolina. And then we have a sea level rise model that was coupled with this. And this was some research we did with CESA, which was most important and, and Reem Deep's uh, thesis and, and working with Dan Tufford. And so the model was trained with historical data and then forecast out into the future. And so this is what the output of that model shows. These spikes are periods of high salinity with zero uh, sea level rise on the far top left a one foot to the, to the right, and then on the bottom, a two and three foot rise of sea level. And so you can see that over time with no sea level rise, we see increasing uh, spikes of high salinity, making drinkability or potability of the water, drinking water in Georgetown in question. And with sea level rise, you can see uh, this becomes very extreme. We were able to take the temperature and salinity outputs from this models this model and develop a Vibrio algorithm to predict the growth of Vibrio over time. And so here we see these spikes of optimum growth conditions for Vibrios, again, starting at the top left, the spikes with no sea level rise, a one foot uh, at the top, and then at the bottom, a two and three foot sea level rise. And so what we see is with the three foot sea level rise, we see a 230% increase in optimum Vibrio growth conditions over time. This tells us that we have to be more concerned about these Vibrio infections in the future. 
Similarly, we are working on HAB models that don't just predict blooms, but actually predict toxin production. These are two graphs uh, from some of the work from our folks at Baylor, uh, Thad Scott and Brian Brooks, where we have taken different nutrient ratios that actually allow us not to predict blooms, but to predict toxins. And it's the toxins that make people sick. And what we clearly see is the grace circles, which are the higher nutrient levels, increase the production of microcystin on the left and cylindrospermopsin toxins on the right. And so being able to forecast where, where we're seeing increased toxins is where we want to go. Similarly with the Vibrios, we want to be able to not just predict where they grow, but also their virulence. And that is very important because we are seeing this significant association between Vibrios and cyanobacteria. This is a study by Diane Greenfield and uh, Dr. Sandifer where they looked at coastal retention ponds, through, which are very frequent throughout the coastal zone. And this is in South Carolina and in the adjoining tidal creeks. And those vertical lines you see are when we had cyanobacteria blooms. And after those, we see, saw concomitant increases in Vibrios. The Vibrios were highly correlated with temperature, dissolved organic matter, and the presence of these blooms. So there is this intimate association between these cyanobacteria blooms and the Vibrios. Our recent work in the, our center has shown that if we have increased levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, the graph on your right uh, looks at the uh, gene expression in response to increasing levels of nitrogen. And this is <clears throat> looking at in Vibrio bacteria. And so what we find is essentially the genes involved in energy metabolism and membrane transport are increased with increasing nutrient levels, like we would find with eutrophication or wastewater treatment plant discharges that are enriched with nitrogen. Uh, the genes particularly involved in motility for the flagellum in Vibrio vulnificus and in biofilm formation were upregulated and this is very significant because this represents a transition from a planktonic form to a biofilm form former. When, my, when Vibrios form biofilms, that's when they become highly antibiotic resistant. So this cue may actually allow us to develop a sensor so we can actually pick up when Vibrios may be making this transition. So that will allow us to actually get some of the virulence into our Vibrio forecast models. This becomes very important because um, these Vibrios uh, uh, are affected uh, particularly with people with underlying liver disease. And, and one of the things we have found, this is a study by Zwang et al. 2015, where they compared uh, cyanobacterial bloom coverage, the orange and reds down the East Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, up the Mississippi River, over by the Great Lakes or where we have high bloom coverage. And to the far right, where you see red, that is where we have a high incidence of a disease called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And again, down the Atlantic coast, some in Florida, along the Gulf Coast. And so for every 1% increase in harmful and cyanobacterial bloom coverage, we saw a 0.3% increase in underlying non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Underlying non, uh, liver disease is a predisposer for uh, sensitivity to Vibrio infections. So this, this ability to uh, understand this linkage is significant. In the laboratory, we have actually exposed mice uh, to a, a fatty diet to actually see whether or not microcystin and some of these toxins can enhance the uh, development of underlying liver disease. And in fact, we took weanling mice and tried to simulate what would happen with an early exposure at the level for contact recreation. Um, and what we found was that early life history exposure brings on early onset of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and insulin resistance. Today, 33% of the U.S. population, we estimate, has uh, non-alcoholic underlying non levels of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is a huge factor that we have to take into account in the future. So that's why educating and alerting and informing and involving the public is so important in translating this information to the public. 
So I'm going to leave you with this last slide. In 1854 in London, we had a problem with Vibria cholera. The issue du jour at that time was urbanization as people moved off of farms into cities with substandard housing and poor sanitation. The result was Vibrio illness. Here we are 167 years later, and we're still dealing with Vibrio illness. The issue du jour this day is climate change. And so I will leave you with that. And just like Sir John Snow was able to develop these visualization tools to help us understand it, developing these forecast models and translation of this technical information is paramount to helping us educate the public today. And with that, I will stop. And I am sorry I went over. <laughs> so uh, let me see if we have any questions. Maybe I can take one and we can move on to the next presentation. Do we have any questions? Okay, well, not hearing any, um, then we will move on to our next presentation. So our next presenter is Dr. Paul Sandifer. And Dr. Sandifer is going to talk to us today about urgent global and coastal climate change research needs. And so I've highlighted some areas of concern for focus. And now Dr. Sandifer is going to talk to you about the broader community of research and what we need to be focused on for climate change. So Dr. Sandifer, I'm going to hand it off to you and, and let you continue. Thank you very much, Jeff. Let's see if we can get these. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can see uh, the materials now. And as Jeff said, my topic is these urgent global and coastal climate change research needs. It'll be at a, a bit higher level uh, than Jeff was talking about, but I'll connect back to his, to his talk toward the end. I wanna talk particularly about some uh, recent work by the National Academies of Sciences Committee to advise the U.S. Global Change Research Program, that is the USGCRP, and a new uh, publication on climate change research needs that uh, Jeff and I co-authored. Starting with the National Academies Committee, uh, it was established in 2011 and charged to advise the USGCRP on a variety of issues as noted on the slide, and I'm not gonna read my slides to you. Uh, since 1989, the USGCRP has been responsible for coordinating and integrating uh, across a number of federal agencies uh, their research on changes in the global environment and their implications uh, for society. Uh, the USGCRP then is an interagency construct. It currently involves 13 uh, federal agencies that either conduct or use climate research. And among other things, the USGCRP produces the, uh, the national climate assessments uh, for this country, and I hope you are familiar with these. I am privileged to be a member of that USGCRP committee, and uh, the specific charge for the report I'm going to talk a little bit about today was to provide input to the USG, USGCRP for its uh, next strategic plan uh, for the decade uh, 2022 to 2031. As you might imagine from uh, recent events, the USGCRP is a little bit behind uh, their schedule, but uh, our report was designed to provide advice on major risks and priorities for research, including in the social scientists, and how the USGCRP might improve its operations and better link uh, with users. Uh, the report is currently available, and I encourage you to get it and take a look at it. It's free, and I think you'll find some useful information. Now, the uh, the evolution of the FOSI of US GCRP has started from the early days when the focus was uh, almost solely on the role of the physical uh, climate system and then the, a little bit of role of ecosystems. And to, to, today the focus is on the coupling of human and natural systems and we're moving into trying to manage the risks that we know are coming posed by global change to human and, and, and coupled uh, natural systems. The committee made, uh, determined that a new approach is needed and made three observations. And first, that traditional climate research is not fully meeting the needs of decision makers. Uh, if we're gonna change, uh, be able to limit change, uh, climate change and manage its consequences. 
And we feel that the USDCRP needs to be broadened both in its scope, scale, and the, and the urgency within uh, with it, which it uh, uh, approaches climate change issues. And the, the Global Change Research Act of 1990 ma mandates that the program provide usable information on which to base policy decisions. But we feel that the, the information needs to be more than just use, usable. It needs to be useful and it needs to be easily used by uh, people at all uh, levels of society. And the most urgent risk are those to the sustained security of critical human systems, that is health security, food security, water security, ener energy security, transportation security, economic security, and national security. And these risks that, that uh, uh, to all of these interlinked systems come from the complex multidirectional con interconnections, interdependencies, and, and their uh, reactions to both the physical manifestations and the way that human systems react. And so understanding these risks will require a much more integrated, integrated and systems-based risk framing in order to identify research priorities. So our report uh, came up with five recommendations. First of all, we would ask that the uh, USGCRP uh, expand on its current integrated risk framing approach, take it a little bit further to identify research priorities. Accelerate the integration and communication on cu coupled human and natural systems uh, from the international, at national scale, the global scale, down to the local. Prioritize research relating to managing risks via mitigation, adaptation, synergies, and trade-offs. We picked five cross-cutting areas we felt were important for expanding research in. That's dealing with extreme thresholds and tipping points, regional and large-scale climate projections, scenario-based approaches. That is storytelling, so people will understand the, the uh, potential consequences of choices made advanced data analysis frameworks, and equity and social justice. And I reiterate, these are all uh, cross-cutting, but most especially uh, the equity and social justice ones are. And of course, to explore organizational and operational changes to increase the effectiveness of the USDCRP. And while I was working on the, this report along with the whole, whole committee, I saw the opportunity to, to go into more depth on a number of research issues that are, are or should be of concern to those who live, work, recreate, along our coastlines uh, and in coastal urban areas. And with our, my partner, Jeff, we, we published uh, this paper that's also freely available. Based on our combined 95 years at this point of professional experience, that tells you we're just two old guys who've been around a long time working on issues related to coastal environments abroad, across a broad range of things. Uh, and with a huge amount of input from the literature, we uh, categorized uh, 12 groups of recommendations or 12, 12 uh, uh, yeah, groups of recommendations about uh, for research on coastal uh, areas and coastal communities. These are abbreviated in the bubbles I've got surrounding the center ovoid, and I'll only have time to, to touch on a few of these today and refer you to the paper if you're interested. But most importantly, uh, I want to call your attention to the fact, and I'll come back to this in a minute, that the USGCRP committee advisory committee used coastal uh, communities as for as the focus for illustrating examples of needed climate change research. And so th that's a really important thing for you to be aware of. In this paper, we include the need to, to measure uh, key uh, com human, community, and environmental health metrics uh, and in order to know what is working and what isn't to learn from disasters, including the global, global COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as much as we can about cascading effects, social and economic, as well as health. Identify the most effective ways to scale up possible interventions. Identify human behaviors that contribute most heavily to community risk, uh, to human behaviors. Uh, design integrated models uh, that, com uh, that combine sea level, uh, precipitation, built environment, and other factors to provide a more holistic uh, flooding uh, predictions at regional to local scales. Find alternatives to coastal retreat and how they can be incentivized and implemented equitably and effectively. And develop ways to minimize the direct health impacts to humans from climate change related threats, such as the harmful algal blooms and infectious diseases uh, that uh, Jeff just, just talked about and pollution, such as from uh, microplastics and others. Okay, so 
Now back to the advisory committee report. And I'm not, not going to ask you to even read all this. I just want to illustrate a few examples where the committee, the advisory committee used uh, coastal communities as the example here is for health security, uh, leading off with uh, threats to health care uh, infrastructure uh, and to, to uh, a study how information about impacts of extreme events and disasters affect health, including uh, COVID. Secondly, uh, they use com coastal communities for, uh, as an example for water security research needs. Also for economic uh, security research needs, things like uh, losses of jobs, uh, it, it, disruption of supply chains and, and port uh, facilities. Uh, and for uh, global extreme events, uh, the levels of how these things can, can propagate across the human and, and natural systems. In addition to these examples, the USG, uh, the advisory committee report uses coastal community, communities to also illustrate research needs related to food security, energy security, and national and international security. And now from a personal perspective, I think one of the most important research areas identified in the committee report for coastal communities uh, is that of need for research related to managed retreat for coastal communities and especially for alternatives to retreat. You can see in this slide and the next one I'll get to that the issue gets a fair amount of attention in our report. Uh, and there are a lot of individual needs, including getting a much better handle on what is happening with existing and relatively recent efforts to reduce the number of properties that are particularly vulnerable to climate change induced flooding through buyouts and relocations. And I think we've heard of some of, about some of these kinds of things in the last day or two. And the necessity to, to include a broad range of considerations, not the least of which is where people moving from the coast might go and with what impact to the receiving communities. Uh, however, these are still postage stamp type uh, solutions and not systemic ones or systematic ones. Absolutely crucial issues here are those of community involvement equity, environmental justice, financing, and the list goes on. There's a lot to be done, and the USGCRP, with its current membership of 13 federal agencies, could provide some badly needed leadership, particularly if its own membership is broadened and it receives additional funding uh, to put into areas like this. Moving on from this issue, we cannot ignore uh, the effects of population growth and coastal development. As a cartoon character Pogo said many years ago, something to the effect of, we have met the enemy and he is us. Uh, this time series map for the Charleston urban area was developed by Dr. Jeff Allen uh, at Clemson University, and it shows the prog progression of the urban footprint print of Charleston since 1973, projected up to, uh, to 2030. 1973, here, picture of 70 square miles of urban area in Charleston was a year after I returned to Charleston from, from graduate school. So this is what I lived in then. And I've been here ever since 1994, up to 250 square miles, over 600 in 2015, and projected to be nearly, um, to be nearly 900 square miles in uh, 2030. Uh, the issue is a lot of P P's, that is people, pavement, and pollution along with loss of wetlands and land covers of the types that could help mitigate some climate effects. At the same time that we see this uh, massive coastal development, we also have sea level rise uh, associated flooding. This is a record of increasing uh, flooding events from 1953 to 2020 in Charleston, a 67 year period put together by Bernie, uh, Bonnie Ertel, a graduate student at the Citadel, and uh, the, the sawtooth solid line uh, is the increased sea level rise. And if, if this is not uh, the poster uh, picture for uh, climate change effects over that period, I don't know what is. Here are a few pictures just to remind us how bad things already were here uh, just a few years ago. We are now experiencing major nuisance flooding numerous times per year instead of a few. In fact, a record of 89 times in 2019 with consequent damage to homes, businesses, roadways, and other infrastructure, and causing major headaches for delivery of emergency and medical services, amongst others. Now, the National Flood Insurance Pro Program insures a lot of coastal and other flood-prone pro properties in all states, but it's broke. 
and its information is not always the best. Uh, we all use FEMA, FEMA flood maps, but they are woefully out of date and less accurate th th than they need to be. And as you can see from this newspaper gra graphic, one third of all South Carolina flood insurance claims have been filed in the last five years. These cl claims total nearly $500 million, and that's almost one third of all claims paid out over the past 45 years. Each of the white circles here represents the number of claims filed between 2015 and 2015. And the size of the circle indicates the number. Look at the concentration of the big amounts along the coast. So let's think about this in terms of the ideas of coastal retreat. If you, this demonstrates the magnitude of the problem. All of the outlined areas are the, com, uh, the combined shoreline and the, the coastal watershed, that is the counties immediately behind the shoreline counties, uh, for all of the contiguous states of the U.S. Uh, these counties uh, have uh, uh, about, uh, include about 52% of the U.S. population and have population densities three to four times as high as that of the rest of the country. And despite the warnings of climate-related dangers to coastal communities and people, we should see no real retreat and no uh, lessening of the movement of people to the coast. So what can we do? Well, in, in, one of the things is uh, forward-leaning approach is to reduce the need for coastal retreat, is to take steps to reduce the, the, the likelihood that areas that are now flood prone are likely to become so don't get built on. Uh, and in one of these stories, uh, to, to uh, your right, the um, uh, rather the, the left hand screen uh, is from uh, illustrates a story from Mount Pleasant, which is uh, built raising the base flood elevation for new construction. Uh, this is important, but it's a partial fix only for areas not already built on. It has the it, it doesn't do anything for areas that are already there. Another approach shown in the the, the other side of the slide is to elevate uh, for existing flood prone structures. Uh, but you talk about expensive. As noted previously, these are more or less postage stamp type answers and not real solutions to the problem. These things and targeted buyouts, while they help, simply cannot be done everywhere or even in most places, which is why other approaches such as a huge seawall are being uh, considered for places like Charleston. In Charleston, uh, our local newspaper, the Post and Courier, this is not an ad for the Post and Courier, but it has done an outstanding job in highlighting uh, the flooding issues and its underlying causes, including climate change, in a con continuing series of featured articles. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, the rising water series uh, call, continues to call attention to the issues, but not just to the aggravation of trying to get around in a flooded mess or the property damage suffered by repeatedly flooded homes, uh, but also the, the disease problems, the health problems, the, the festering soup of disease carrying uh, microbes. The fact is that people have to move through these waters, these flood waters, exposing scrapes and wounds to infections and getting potentially infected waters on their hands and in their faces and, and nose and mouths. And children do this, too. Uh, in this article, the reporters note that uh, they tested these waters uh, through a private lab specifically for e, e. coli, an indicator of fecal or sewage pollution, also can indicate uh, animal waste and found levels six to 69 times safe levels designated by DHEC. One can safely say that the yuck factor is very high for Charleston floodwaters and probably for elsewhere too. And this is taken uh, from a recent publication from the Center for Public Integrity, and it details some of the issues with other bacteria, the ones that Jeff talked about, the Vibrio parahemolyticus and Vibrio vul vulnificus. And as Jeff noted, uh, these species occur naturally in coastal waters, and are both are expected to become more abundant with rising temperatures and greater distribution of brackish water as a result of, of climate change. And they cause, when they occur, they can cause very, very serious illness. Finally, climate change, including its flooding effects, deepen existing inequalities and the impacts and burdens that uh, uh, many communities already face. Thus, community involvement in climate change research and implementations of findings is crucial. And we say this in our USGCRP report too. Such involvement must in include all segments of communities, especially those that have historically faced economic and other disparities. 
One example we are working on now uh, through our, our Oceans and Human Health Center is a project named EJ Strong with the EJ for Environmental Justice. This project is working to build community resilience through disaster risk reduction training, including for dealing with climate change. So let me summarize with a few take home points. Coastal areas are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Climate change related flooding is a true, truly existential threat to some coastal communities and may become so for many more. Recommendations from our uh, National Academies Advisory Committee to the USDCRP prioritize many areas for uh, U.S. climate change research using coastal communities as exemplars, and I encourage you to take a look at this. Uh, research needs to be integrated and systems-based, focused on the security of critical human systems and include robust uh, social as well as natural science. Some areas of particular concern include how to incentivize and manage coastal retreat equitably when it is necessary, as well as to how to minimize for retreat. User participation and community involvement in the design and co conduct of climate research are essential. Research findings need to not only to be useful, but also usable and easy to use at the levels of states, uh, counties, and communities. And I encourage you as the USGCRP uh, begins to develop its new strategic plan and send it out for, for public comment to take the time to comment. And with that, uh, I thank you and I'll be glad to answer any questions or we can wait and do them during our discussion period. Jeff? Oh, it's my, my turn to introduce Katya, who will be coming up next. Katya Altman, as Jeff said, is a doctoral candidate in the, uh, Envi the Department of Environmental Health Sciences uh, and part of our Oceans and Human Health Center at the University of South Carolina. Katya? Thank you, Dr. Sandifer, and thank you, Dr. Scott, for the introductions and for your presentations. And uh, my presentation is, uh, I can share my screen. Okay, great. All right. So my presentation will talk more about, um, well, more about the One Health concept and developing um, integrated approach to community engagement uh, through socio-environmental report card perspective, working directly with coastal communities uh, for that. All right, and as Dr. Scott um, mentioned, one Health approach is a CDC concept that developed through a collaborative, multi-sectoral and transdisciplinary approach. And it, it's working on uh, different scales. And uh, the main goal is to achieve optimal health outcomes for human health, environmental health, and animal health. Um, so how that connects to oceans and human health. So we have four centers that are funded uh, by National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, uh, and some of them also funded for national science, uh, through National Science Foundation. Four of those centers are Woods Hole Centers for Ocean and Human Health, also Great Lakes Center for uh, Freshwater and Human Health, also Great the Caribbean Center for Secretary Research and our Center for Oceans and Human Health and Climate Change Interactions at the University of South Carolina. So all of the centers focus on one more of these topics, um, harmful algal blooms, both marine and fresh water, also infectious microbes, uh, including Vibrio bacteria and contaminants of emerging concerns such as microplastics. All four centers consist of research projects and also um, community engagement course. Each community engagement core helped to dedicate uh, to, um, I, they dedicated to facilitating bi-directional communication between each center, be, among centers and also their audiences, including center investigators, PIs and um, center stakeholders and other audiences that each center identifies for, for their outreach in um, bi-directional communication. Um, so during our first joint meeting, we develop um, 
integrated educate alert inform involve strategy uh, with um, highlight on connecting and working with coastal freshwater and environmental justice communities through that work so our first um, joint meeting took place uh, in october of 2019 and uh, we gathered there with funders, all centers, uh, principal investigators, and community engagement core leads to discuss how we can achieve combined effort and impact uh, for developing an integrated community engagement strategy. Some of the things that came up is a need for leveraging existing resources and networks, identifying areas for distinction and areas of commonality, uh, support each other in areas of distinction and working more aggressively in areas that are um, of commonality. Uh, also trying to identify which of the communication and community engagement tools should be adopted for more centers and connected and integrated across all four centers. Uh, and what strategy will broaden scope of initiatives and opportunities. So thinking through that systematically, develop this, um, this framework, educate, alert, inform, uh, involve, and also, as you can see, assessment throughout. Um, so each of these um, categories have specific goals. For example, educate goal, uh, help to develop effective informal and formal educational opportunities for multiple audiences, including um, principal investigators and also central stakeholders there. Alert goals are public health protection through effective multi-layered risk messaging there, and also developing models, predictive models to um, to talk about, to, about those risks. Also, um, informed goals are uh, help to improve public health protection where targeted training on OHH research. And this one is mostly connecting with uh, medical community, emergency room physicians and medical students to get them more um, educated about uh, harmful algal blooms and other um, concerns. The strategy that I talk more today would be um, involved goals. Those are actively engaged participants to as learners and practitioners of OHH uh, research. And those are mostly uh, citizen science uh, work that we do, but also work with socio-environmental report cards. Okay. So what are the uh, socio-environmental report cards? Um, they are assessment and communication products that compare ecological, social, and economic information against predetermined goals and objectives. And um, they use community engagement and co-production approaches in its development. So those cards are also timely assessment on environmental conditions and communication tools that set priority areas, allow, allow progress tracking and reporting, and also they're an avenue to share success stories and about environmental quality improvements. And here's some exam examples of them right here. So University of Maryland Center of Environmental Sciences Integration Application Network, um, they are a leader in, in uh, socio-environmental cards co-production in the United States and worldwide. So uh, socio-environmental report cards use a collaborative process to communicate complex scientific information about the status of a water body or region in a clear and concise manner that's appropriate for general public and uh, decision makers. So on this information, pyramid, report cards are very high on information synthesis and low on information density. Report cards are produced using the five-step approach. And here are the steps. So um, the first step is conceptualize. The second one, choose indicators, determine thresholds, calculate grades, and communicate. And all of those, those steps are developed through co-production with community members. So for um, this presentation, I will talk about um, two studies and share preliminary results for those two studies. Um, and um, the guiding questions for the first study was to define socio-environmental report cards as science communication and community engagement tool. And I did um, content analysis for report cards for that one um, and some data visualization using um, NVIVA software um, for the second one, 
um, the guiding question was what are the uh, local level preferences and needs in science communication and research translation in the coastal community. For that study, um, we selected a coastal community of Merle's Inland, um, South Carolina, and I conducted, conducted uh, interviews with community leaders about their science communication and research translation um, preference needs and experiences. Um, so overarching hypothesis is that the socio-environmental report cards in the coastal community will promote community engagement on multiple levels uh, during a report card co-production co process through co-design and also through co-implementation and assessment phases. So the first project is analysis of 101 report cards. So I downloaded the report card, uh, cards uh, and um, selected 101 of them for um, qualitative analysis. And I used Enviva 12 software, it's a qualitative data analysis software um, to help me with this process, to analyze cases, do coding, and also data visualization. So for data visualization techniques, I used word frequencies, cluster analysis, and hierarchy charts. Um, for results, so those 101 uh, report cards um, I organized them in cases, so there were a lot of them that were developed for rivers, also some for lakes, harbors, bays, and sounds, and there were also some other um, regions like uh, Great Bear Reef and dif different um, other locations. So a lot of those uh, ecosystem, well, socio-environmental report cards are clustered in the United States around Chesapeake Bay area, but also um, in different locations as well. So um, developing the United States perspective, but also have um, different um, examples of uh, global perspectives there as well. All right, so um, for all of the report cards, um, this is the word cloud of, of 100 most frequent words from all of the 101 report cards that were selected for analysis. And um, so this is a one for um, base, river, harbors, and uh, this is all of the, the other ones category together. So this is, um, this is somewhat busy um, graphic with, uh, this is codes. Uh, hierarchy for the report cards with indicators, um, actions, theme, uh, programs, and process descriptions. So how this um, is generated, it's basically using Inviva 12 through open coding. Those are topics that have been developed through going through each of the card and manually coding it for different categories. So um, I knew that there are going to be a lot of different indicators, and you can see uh, water quality and quantity, and then the, the lower level is water quality, and then there are different ones for nutrients, um, um, and also dissolved oxygen, water clarity. So uh, for also for indicators, so water quality, ecosystems, people in society. But what interesting was this emerging part with actions and themes and topics that I did not expect to see from report cards. And then I'll, I'll talk about those um, in more detail. So some of the results for emerging themes um, that a lot of report cards been talking about agriculture and their impacts on quality and uh, suggestions for mitigations of impacts of climate change through through that. Also climate change was a big topic in uh, impacts of climate change on water quality. Uh, report cards also talk about uh, harmful algal blooms and increase in toxic um, algae impacts. Also, there was a big piece about uh, environmental literacy and values and threats and stressors and solutions for each region. And uh, this community effort to come up with this um, values and threats um, as a group um, to show what people are care, care about for, for, for each particular card. Um, also land management, um, so importance of restoration and um, future use and planning, importance of partnerships, also sources of pollution, um, importance of water clarity and their connection with, with aquatic vegetation was a big concern. Water quality, of course, is a 
big concern because a lot of this uh, report card has a um, focus on water quality parameters and how they impact measured conditions. Also, there was a connection with weather and climate ev uh, events and how that um, impacts water quality usually during um, right after rain events, during right after rain events, water quality goes down. Um, some of the report cards talk about wetlands and they're important in uh, nitrogen re removal and a big part also wildlife and plants. Another emerging theme was community call for action to reduce impacts on ecosystems and water quality categories. And um, each um, a lot of report cards had a long list of uh, practices that they um, encourage communities to use and I organize them in these categories. So a lot of them are stormwater management, um, best, best management practices there, uh, reduction in stream water pollution, such as reduction in fertilizer and energy use, um, well, reduction in fertilizer and reduction in energy use, uh, rain, installing rain gardens and native vegetation, and also installing rain barrels. Um, building living shorelines, also wildlife control and fencing cattle or other livestock out of streams can help to increase uh, water quality. Um, also, um, a lot of report cards celebrate successes over environmental efforts and encourage people to be responsible citizens in reporting pollution, picking up after their pets, uh, participating in monitoring and cleanup activities. And, um, a lot of um, old report cards would encourage people to volunteer and the new report cards uh, would suggest to volunteer with um, time or if the time is not available, donations if those are available um, as a way to um, show um, connection to the place and um, helping to restore water quality. All right, so that was the first project. Uh, the second one is um, another qualitative project through semi-structured interviews with community leaders. And uh, that one was exploring science communication research translation needs in the coastal community in South Carolina. And that one is around Merle's Inland uh, area. So I developed an interview guide uh, and it was approved through uh, Institutional Review Board at the University of South Carolina. And the interview guide was developed uh, on, build upon our previous research. So as a community engagement core, we did a similar study with um, center investigators about their science communication and research trans translation preference and needs, and also with uh, center stakeholders. And the next one was with coastal stakeholders. Uh, so we can um, see what works, what doesn't work for different categories. Um, so for this particular study, participant recruitment was through um, stakeholder mapping with a trusted community partner. We identified a list of stakeholders they would like to talk, um, talk about. And those are stakeholders with water quality concerns in the area. Um, so we, um, I contacted them via email and scheduled a about 45 minutes interview on Zoom. So out of 17 people contacted, I interviewed 12 uh, and data were recorded and transcribed uh, by transcription service. And for that one, I use otter.ai. Um, transcripts were uploaded in the Nigo 12 uh, uh, qualitative data management software and uh, I used thematic, thematic analysis, Brown and Clark, to analyze my data. So results for this study, um, so my 12, my 12, 12 participants mostly uh, as they were selected are, uh, their health topics are water quality, watershed management, environmental protection and improvement, land conservation with focus on business and uh, community in the Merle's in that area. And uh, some of them, those are representatives of um, uh, state agencies and they connected to different uh, programs such as beach monitoring program, fish tissue monitoring program, offshore fisheries, harmful algal blooms monitoring, and shellfish sanitation program as well. Okay, so when asked about their intended audiences, uh, the categories of audiences um, 
can be organized by the decision makers, people in specific geographic location, people based on their activities, and also industry um, industry as a key audience. For preferred communication um, tactics through conversation, through those interviews, a lot of um, different communication tactics were named. And so those are just the, the list of the ones that have been coded um, for that. Interestingly, social media came up very frequently. And um, that was an interesting result for social media as a communication tactic for local nonprofit organizations. Um, they mostly communicate through Facebook with their, with their audiences, and it's very important for them. Um, don't use Instagram as much and don't really have um, much Twitter presence, even though they tried. Um, however, for a scientific community like us, Twitter is becoming a main uh, social media communication. But for community groups, Facebook is still very, very, very strong. Um, so websites are, of course, very important. So. Uh, and they can easily be curated with website analytics for visits uh, and available for evaluation as well. Um, so as far as meetings, they are, um, there are general meetings, advisory board meetings, one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations, and meetings are a more personal way to address environmental issues. A lot of organizations have um, newsletters or have developed newsletters recently, um, and they have them weekly and monthly, or um, they use them to bring specific actionable information to key audiences. And that's been a great channel for, for that type of communication. Also events uh, and um, participants talk about the events in the, in the past, but then how COVID impacted that. that um, having their own events and setting up uh, tables at community events is, is a great practice to connect with broader groups and not just local but also visitors. Community cleanups is a very popular type of event in the area and also before the registration was through paper tickets and now registration is online which helps to track um, keep track with the audiences and use that information for evaluation. So a lot of the online um, tactics for communication are um, more accessible for evaluation versus giving out a brochure or um, things like that. So also local media is very important in the area and participants talk to um, local media quite a lot and um, share stories and also try to educate them about environmental um, concerns. And um, um, some of the things that came up as a um, interesting way to be more um, accessible to people is to have a phone line. Um, some um, DHAC, for example, shellfish monitoring program maintains a 1 and 100 number for shellfish harvesting because not everyone has access to a computer or social media, and that's how they share the information, which is what was um, really interesting. Also, a new improvement is signage. So those are uh, location specifics like uh, swimming advisories or the check my beach signs that it's a new initiative just started last year. Um, DHAC put about 500 signs in um, Grand Strand area uh, to communicate with people directly on the beach. All right. So participants name uh, many challenges that they uh, experience when trying to reach the intended audiences. So one of the biggest one is uh, discrepancies between scientific and public knowledge and the general environmental literacy of the public. Also evaluating the reach of messages, it can be challenging because some of the basic ways of evaluation are counts, counts of people that attended events, counts of people that um, click on the page or link, but some more sophisticated ways for um, analysis are needed to actually um, evaluate the reach. 
so also limited by time and resources to increase engagement and personal turnover when they have some of the challenges for many organizations. Um, also, nuisance and uncertainty communicating science is a big concern and scientists are uh, very comfortable communicating uncertainty, but general public have usually do not have experiences like that or people that people that work with scientists are a little bit more comfortable or their scientists themselves are more comfortable about communicating uncertainty, but people that are not connected to science they just say they, they don't have experience in communicating uncertainty and um, find this question very confusing. So also perception of environmentalists is uh, very, um, can be a um, little bit more to an extreme and that can um, make perception of messages not as trustworthy. Also reaching, uh, preaching to the choir and reaching uh, out to different groups can be a challenge. So. Uh, some of the groups, besides um, hard to reach audiences like EJ communities, also connecting to hunting and fishing, um, power borders, people who do not care about the river, but who still need clean water daily, and also working with family and younger populations, and um, also connecting with people who view environmental topics opposed to their goals. So those are harder to reach areas. Um, also, technology for certain age groups or communities can be uh, challenging. And um, another thing is um, working with uh, citizen science groups. A lot of those people are um, white, older, retired um, community members. They have time to participate and um, in collecting environmental data but connecting with other audiences that might not, um, that have full-time jobs or have families is the way through setting up events and catering for those audiences specifically and knowing who those, who those audiences are and what they might of interest to them. So uh, that was the best practices, what things work for the participants um, through their collective um, understanding and experiences. So um, they suggested that uh, to have your main messages organized, especially talking directly to community member, have those a few bullet points uh, with main messages that you want to share. Also, language should be at the appropriate grade level. And um, important to use layman terms that are easy to understand, no acronyms or special uh, terms the audience might not be familiar with. Also using simpler, straightforward, plain language. Uh, and a lot of science communicators know that. And that's something that might be a gap in communicating that way with the um, people that are in the scientific community that are so um, used to talking with, um, with their peers and um, sharing um, information with um, very specific terms, jargon, acronyms, and knowing that people, their peers understand them, but that those are might not be accessible for broader community. Also breaking down more uh, into more digestible bytes of information and have, have a summary or nested levels of information for that communication and also providing a full report and also like a Cliff Notes, notes uh, version of um, findings or things that you're trying to communicate, especially if it's more um, information um, dense. Also, um, reaching out to partners to help with science translation, especially the partners that know the area, especially know their audiences there, you know what works for, for specifics there in that particular location. Also, adding pictures and videos, showing graphics that are not overwhelming, um, and uh, making information dynamic, dynamic, and it's uh, easy to do with websites where information can be, um, content can be changed frequently. Also making a personal connection between what you're trying to talk about and that person and uh, trying to know your audiences. And with that one-on-one -on -one consultation with stakeholders or communication, one-on-one -on -one communication at events is very helpful uh, and also, talking to people where they are is uh, is very helpful as well um, because you also get an instant fed feedback and with their questions you can you can have that bi-directional communication which is so helpful to building that 
to share and it, it helps with science communication so much. So um, our primary focus is on developing sustained partnerships uh, between scientists and stakeholders and to facilitate science communication and research translation on scientific results on a local level. And this research helps to inform that in the, this particular community in South Carolina. And with that, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Katia, and uh, thank you, Paul, for those great presentations. And um, I, I guess we will throw the floor open for questions. I, I'm looking at the chat. I don't see any, so let me throw open the floor and see if folks have questions. They would, And anybody, please feel free to speak up and relay your question if you like. Okay, well, not hearing any. <laughs> then I, I, yeah, uh, and I'm, Cotty, if you can check the chat one more time and make sure I didn't miss anything. But just, um, yeah, in the chat, we just have comments. Uh, let's see any questions there. Okay. Well, I'd like for us now to have a little bit of discussion about what you just heard uh, about oceans and human health. And I want to start with a con, you know, with a point Dr. Sandifa made regarding how coastal communities are changing. And since this climate is about, I mean, this conference is about climate change, what Dr. Sandifa showed you with that map of Charleston and the dynamic change in, in population growth, we're seeing that reflected in a lot of places. Uh, just to give you an example, the city of Charlotte, we have seen the population there almost double since 2008. And so we're seeing a lot of regions in the entire Carolinas be dramatically transformed um, to more urban centers. And so that makes our challenges of controlling factors that can contribute to things that affect our health, that is harmful algal blooms, vibrios, microplastics, a lot more difficult. Um, but I think the one issue, and I'm going to ask each of you to maybe pick one issue um, in terms of climate change that you think is perhaps one of our greatest uh, uh, threats. And I'll start this off because I think, Dr. Sandifer, you hit on one that I think is absolutely uh, and extremely important. And that is fair weather flooding uh, with sea level rise. And uh, I think, as you indicated, that we're seeing this occur with greater frequency and regularity. Some of the very issues we're dealing with, um, with uh, vibrios, harmful algae, chemical contaminants, you name it, are in those floodwaters. And I think what's really most important, most of our beach forecasts are based on rainfall. And we actually have evidence now that we're getting beach closures during fair weather events, which is, is leaves us without a warning system for these types of flooding events. So I really think that is going to require us to really incorporate this flooding into a lot of our thinking. So in, in my opinion, that was one that, that really hit home. So Paul, I'll let you have a shot at it and then we'll move to Katia. All right, Jeff, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna build off of yours first. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> one of, I think one of the, the crucial things that, that comes out of, of, of your presentation uh, on the climate change effects related to, to uh, bacteria and to, and to HABs and along with these, this uh, increase in, in flooding is the, the increasing likelihood that our floodwaters not only contain uh, sewage, for example, uh, and, and animal waste, but they will uh, contain these Vibrio bacteria, they'll contain marine habs, and then we get the, the precipitation, the, the extreme event of the heavy precipitation runoff, bringing the cyanobacteria out of the fresh waters downstream. So we have this interaction yeah. of, of, uh, of, 
uh, marine stuff, sewage and related stuff, uh, cyanobacteria and pollution uh, coming down. The Charlotte pollution, for example, does yeah. roll, roll downhill to the to the sea. Uh, so that so that we we have this almost perfect storm that appears to be coming together, where the where the climate change impacts and the development impacts. Uh, are likely, highly likely, to increase the probabilities. I, don't, I won't say that uh, of immediate health effects, but increase the probabilities of interaction amongst these microbes and uh, uh, their interactions with with humans. They're more and more humans, uh, and so the uh, the wading through uh, the, the the toxic soup, as it was described for New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, or, <laughs> Katrina, or the festering soup, as uh, yeah. as the Charleston paper. De described it. I think those are going to be some some really big concerns uh, coming coming down the pike. Uh, and on a, a slightly different view, one I didn't talk about today, but one that our uh, our friends in the in the European area work on a lot of the health benefits of coastal living, and they are real. But there are also these these concerns, and my, one of my concerns is that the health benefits we've been seeing from living on the coast may begin to be eroded uh, considerably by these environmental uh, concerns of the interaction of the climate change effects um, and the development effects. Yeah, Paul, and if I could just jump in before I go to Katia, um, I'll mention one thing that I think is really critical, and you mentioned this in your talk, uh, and that is that with more and more retirees moving to the coast, we have a, a much more vulnerable population with both the young and the old, and also with young families moving. We have greater potential for exposure to vulnerable populations. Absolutely. And, and, and you cannot avoid waiting in that water if you have to move around and go out. And so th th this is going to raise the specter of how we address some of those issues. And, and so, um, I'm going to let Katia have a shot now. And, and so, Katia, what did you think would be your greatest concern in terms of uh, oceans and human health uh, based upon climate change today? Well, um, I absolutely agree that the coastal communities is a concern and also working with more vulnerable populations. And we have concerns of harmful algal blooms, and also other things like contaminants of emerging concern. And for me, especially going through the data that I collected through report cards and seeing harmful algal blooms there as a emerging issue that wasn't there even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, seeing that coming up over and over again as a, first as a water quality concern, but we know more, and it's an emerging issue, the science on, on harmful algal blooms is still developing. So, and there, it's very complex and we're learning so much. Uh, so first is a, it seemed like just a um, water quality um, concern for the water or the way the water looks, but then we see with the cyanobacteria that even when the water is clear, toxic cyanobacteria might be present and it can be detrimental to wildlife, or pets, or um, others that come in contact. So it's becoming a very big uh, public health concern, human health concern, well, one health concern. And we're seeing those more and more, and that's, that's very alarming. And we still yeah. don't know why we why we have that so much. Is it connected to nutrients? Probably. Is it connected to increased uh, temperatures? Yes. Is it connected to climate extremes, including floods and droughts? And how's it going to play out in the future? And do we have uh, adequate ways to communicate those risks to publics and to the most vulnerable populations in the way that they can understand, they can access that information, and they can action out and useful to protect their families. So that's what I'm, yeah. I'm very interested in. And, and I really think you hit on the complexities of trying to communicate this highly technical information. And I think it requires training of our scientists as we've been trying to do with 
um, you know, best, better messaging so we can become better articulators of it. Um, and, and so I really think, um, you know, another issue in, with the floodwaters, Paula and Katia, are pips. Yeah. Pets have got to go. They're going to go out into these waters as well. And some of these um, freshwater halves are extremely toxic to pets. Everybody uh, back to September, about in 2020, we had these deaths of dogs in North Carolina and Texas. It was for Midian. We now have that in Lake Watery right outside of Columbia. And we're seeing this around the country expand with more contact recreational areas. And while dolphins were certainly the um, creature du jour for coastal issues, I think pets are the creature du jour for HABs, these freshwater HAB events, because people love their pets. And, and so this is really waking people up, and it's a way to use that in our communication message. And, and so that may be something we'll, we'll need to look at. Um, Paul, I want to go back to one thing you said, and that was the retreat issue. And because I really do think of, of the policy issues, this is something that nobody wants to tackle. We have a hurricane. All we ever show on TV is we're going to rebuild and come back. And that's, that's notable, laudable. We all applaud that. On the other hand, maybe we can't always do that. And, and I think if we don't start having those dialogues soon <laughs> at important levels to have a logical way to think about this issue, I think it's going to hit us like a ton of bricks, just like COVID hit us where we weren't prepared. And so you want to comment a little on that? Cause I know you and I have had a lot of conversations about this. Yeah. I, I uh, I'm one of those who, uh, uh, is perhaps skeptical about retreat, uh, mo- not not necessarily the need for it, but the realities of, of mm-hmm. how one tries to to develop a a, a program of retreat that makes uh, that makes sense and is affordable in any way, shape, or form. If you think the projected cost of of, of a billion and a half or more for the uh, the uh, Charleston Seawall is high, think about moving the city. Uh, yeah. You know the so so the uh, there ha- there have to be some some real uh, policy decisions and a lot of technical information has to go into that. It has to be useful and usable in in the context of, of uh, what what places are bought out for you know that have been uh, repeat, repeated reflooded uh, and and insurance is paid for. But it can't be just based on on insurance issues. Uh, what's the most vulnerable places? What are the ones? And there are some communities around where the people are are in fact clamoring to leave if they had options that didn't mean that meant uh, yeah. they lost their entire investments and so on. You know, so there's a lot of things to do. And in and in some cases, uh, the communities that are most affected are again the the uh, the least able to uh, uh, from in terms of financial capability and political clout, frankly. Uh, to to get uh, help to to do much, so we need a lot of discussion, a lot of options here. That some of which may be mixing uh, natural and and uh, built infrastructure, and some may actually mean saying, okay, we identify these places, uh, places that we cannot practically save. How do we yeah. then practically move away, move back someplace, and and make it uh, something that people can who, who are moving can can live with and the people and the places they're going can live with and those are not easy questions to answer and so i think it's going to take this is where having much more social science involved in climate change research and and research on policy alternatives not trying to say this is the policy you got to follow but what are the policies alternatives and then using scenarios if when you communication, the, the kinds of things that Conti was talking about, where you, you talk to people and you and and you pose the what if questions, you know, and and here's what we know now, and if we do this, this is the kind of thing that might happen, and you let let them ask what if questions, then you get yeah. some understanding uh, of of your choices and the consequences there. Are. So I think that there's you know it's going to take a lot of work, Jeff. Yeah, a lot of work, and I think I, I, I was listening to one of the sessions yesterday, 
uh, and Tom Mulliken from the South Carolina <laughs> Flood, Flood Waters Commission uh, had, a, had a quote. I, I, I'm not sure I got it exactly right, but I think he was talking about climate change research and, and, and his comment, and, and I used it uh, elsewhere yesterday too, is, is basically get it out of the clouds and down on the ground where it affects people. And yeah. if you add to that, Katia's work and, and her colleagues, get it down to the ground where it affects people and tell them about it in a way they can, they can use it. Um, yeah, and, and I really think the report card or that engagement tool exactly. is the way to engage the public. And Katia really demonstrated. And, you know, it's very interesting, Katia. We didn't see climate come up much in, in some of those report cards. And so I think maybe <laughs> one of our next big challenges is to think about making a bigger module for that and, and trying to engage. I, I think most people don't know it doesn't come up as much because I think most people don't know how to address it. But, you know, what's most interesting in your presentation, Katia, is the uh, the enhanced uh, met health metrics and, and, and climate change vulnerability issues that, that did come up. Those are all prevention strategies, and that's what public health is all about, is prevention. And, you know, our whole focus in our research is preventing people from being exposed. And so I think if you can get people to understand that, that, you know, Paul, it's just what you said. We've seen the enemy in his us. We, we, have to, we have to embrace that, I think. And, and so... Uh, getting people, helping people to embrace that and that there's, you know, we all have to deal with it. And maybe that's the first step of moving us in that direction. Uh, I, I will tell you, we did not talk about mold today, yeah. but when you frequently flood a house, yep. you're not going to be able to live in it because the types of molds that are produced Cause liver uh, goes right back liver injury again. <laughs> so you know, here we go again with the vibrio. So I'm only saying this is going to be a huge health issue, which will basically we do know people can't live in houses when they're condemned, and so the public health departments are going to have to be very much involved in this and and addressing this, and and it really is going to boil down to. Where do people go if they're trying to fix their house? Because we know right now there's a huge housing shortage in Charleston right now. What a two week supply of houses at any given day. So where are you going to go live while you're fixing your house, while you're moving? So so this is a huge issue. And one, so I, we, we, we have to. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, I, I would like Katia to wrap us up with uh, yeah. uh, with with, you know, the take homes from actually uh, working to communicate to the public. Yeah, let's do that. Well, the thing that comes to mind is uh, a lot of those approaches are very reactive and the same thing that we're trying to move to more proactive understanding, first developing the knowledge, then making it accessible, and then uh, have it there for people to make more sound decisions with the facts, right? So, uh, and I think that's gonna be there's a lot of work and it's a there should be a big connection with social sciences and natural sciences to get this um, holistic, systematic way and approach to addressing climate change and all of the impacts that, that follow. Yeah. If, there's one, if there's one thing we've learned from the COVID pandemic, besides all the disruptions to us, is that uh, denial is still not just a river in, uh, in Egypt. In Egypt. <laughs> we, we are, you know, the, the, uh, uh, you've got to get around uh, the denial uh, and the, or the head stuck in the sand kind, uh, kind of, uh, of behavior. And so that takes knowledge of how people uh, receive and react to information trusted purveyors of information and so on, Kati, and where people working like you are and social scientists could help us a great deal. And with that, uh, I'm going to just see if there's any last comment from the uh, folks on online in case we have any last comments. 
Well, on behalf of Paul and Katia and myself, thank you so much for allowing us to present some information to you on oceans and human health. This is a really, really big issue for the Carolinas. And, you know, when you think about what we saw in Florida with a 19 month beach closure throughout much of the state, with tourism being such a vital part, we have to understand and embrace these things. And so thank you, Paul. Thank you, Katia. Thank you folks for sticking with us.